Good morning. It's Monday, the 22nd of January, and this is Govind Raj Raj based in Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top stories and themes for the day. Short trading week could see markets hold back. What triggers should one track? Global tech giant stocks bounce back. What a strong US market means for us. And Indian banks struggle for more low-cost deposits while consumer product companies see sales slowing down. India's quantum computing mission is off the block, a sneak preview. Electric vehicle sales in the United States are slowing down. Could it plateau in India too? This is a core report with Govindraj Ethiraj. Finding the next market triggers. Before I start, 2024 has already kicked off as a year of extreme weather, winter storms in the United States and extreme heat waves in Australia with temperatures over 45 degrees Celsius and bushfires predicted. Earth's average surface temperature in 2023 was the warmest on record according to an analysis by NASA. Global temperatures last year were about 2.1 degrees Fahrenheit or 1.2 degrees Celsius above the average for NASA's baseline period. That's 1951 to 1980, according to scientists from NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York. Now, this obviously means that right now, America will and is consuming more energy and fuel in trying to stay warm, and countries like Australia will do the same to keep things cooler. Speaking of energy, Reliance Industries' earnings from oil to chemicals divisions are poised to remain volatile and range-bound, a top company executive and analysts also said, according to a report in Business Standard. The oil-to-telecom conglomerate, that's Reliance, reported a 9.3% year-on-year increase in its consolidated net profit for the quarter ended 2023. This was tempered by weakness in the energy segment, which offset steady profit growth in Reliance's retail and telecom businesses, according to the company. Reliance's management said that while the refining margins environment looks favorable, the downstream remains under pressure. The downstream includes petrochemicals, fuel retailing, and of course, refining. The core's energy coverage is supported by India Energy Week to take place on February 6th. Log on to www.indiaenergyweek.com for more details. The global equity markets are soaring though, hitting all-time highs with tech stocks leading the fray. Before we go there, let's look at India, where stocks ended lower in a special trading session on Saturday. The Nifty 50 was down 0.2% to 21,571, while the BSE Sanjex was down 0.4% to 71,423. Markets are shut today, Monday, because of a late declared public holiday, while Friday will also be shut because of Republic Day. So this is a shortened trading week in India and will most likely see lower trading activity. Now, domestic triggers are largely in the form of Q3 results, which are not looking very good, at least from the street's point of view, expectations being high, particularly from banks and the larger consumer giant companies. Banks are unable to raise cheaper deposits and consumer product giants like Hindustan Unilever are seeing sales slow down and thus profits. The broader consumer market is not growing and nor are companies really able to increase prices. And this is something that we will spend a little time on, but not today. The Lal Street so is focused on the interest rate moves of the Bank of Japan and European Central Bank, along with US GDP data now as triggers because the shocks from the Indian Q3 results seem to have now been absorbed or it's abated. The good news as market triggers go is that the S&P 500 closed at an all-time high on Friday at about 4,840. The Dow Jones, which set its own record at the end of last year, added about 395 points while the smaller, more tech-focused Nasdaq 100 also hit a record high. So the S&P 500's gain has to be seen in the context of a near 20% loss in 2022. So it lost 20% in 2022 and gained 24% in 2023. The tech sector gained about 2.5% on Friday, more than 4% during the trading week, making it the S&P's best-performing sector week to date. The tech sector doing well in the United States does not really affect the tech sector in India. At least I wouldn't draw any correlation there since Indian IT services companies get their business mostly from non-tech companies in the Western markets like banks, retail or telecom companies. 
But a strong US market has and more likely will keep sentiment strong across and wash over to India as well. That, of course, in turn will depend on factors like interest rates in the United States. If they are low, then more capital will flow into equities. And conversely, if they stay high, then money will not flow into equities, at least at the same intensity. Meanwhile, Meta's stock price has fully rebounded, rising almost 2% on Friday to close at $383, and that's a new record. Meta is Facebook. The rally follows a 200% jump last year and also leads on from CEO Mark Zuckerberg's major cost-cutting initiatives in 2023, according to CNBC. Meta's previous high was in September 21 at about $382, which was a peak in the tech bull market on the heels of COVID. Now, Meta's market cap is, however, below its record because the company has been buying back tens of billions of dollars in stock, said CNBC. In September 2021, its market cap was near $1.1 trillion, and currently it's below $1 trillion. So investors are increasingly bullish on the company's position in the booming AI or artificial intelligence market. And Mark Zuckerberg said last week in an Instagram Reels posting that Meta will have 350,000 NVIDIA H100 graphic cards by the end of the year, along with almost 600k H100 equivalents of compute if you include other GPUs. Now, all of this obviously suggests that the company is spending billions of dollars and effort to help support its AI ambitions, CNBC reported. And if I were to take you a little back, a year ago, Meta was all about the metaverse, and now it's all about AI and artificial intelligence, something the markets are clearly rewarding. More on computing, but in this case, quantum computing, and in India, and that's coming up shortly. The Indian Bank's Deposit Hunt If you are like me, you do not keep money in the bank account except for essential predictable purchases every month and of course EMIs and the like. The rest goes immediately to a mutual fund or similar. So many of us are using banks mostly as a very temporary and quick parking slot in the beginning of the month to move funds around. Now this is of course not new, but the trend is getting more pronounced and banks are suffering and struggling as they look to find deposits and that too at the cost that are quite frankly non-inflation beating, to put it mildly. To pick up an example, let's look at ICICI Bank whose net interest margins, a measure of how lenders make or how much they make on every loan sold, shrank to about 4.4% in the three months ended December 31st, so that's the third quarter, from 4.5% in the previous quarter, according to Bloomberg. So more broadly, Indian banks are facing challenges in mobilizing low-cost deposits to fuel a high demand for credit and therefore profitability. As many financial market veterans are pointing out, Indians are moving from being savers to being investors, which means they would rather put money into stocks or market-linked instruments where returns are higher and they can have some hope of beating the real inflation. Of course, the market veterans I have been referring to have been hoping for this phenomenon for several decades. Anyway, it's here and the signs are not very good. While earnings at Indian banks have increased in recent quarters on rising demand for credit, the Reserve Bank of India has begun warning of a potential buildup of risks because of unsecured lending which is rising almost twice as fast as overall credit. According to Bloomberg, shares of HDFC Bank, India's largest private sector lender, fell the most in more than three years on Wednesday after it posted earnings that had signaled a slowdown. According to Bloomberg again, while banks being run by good and talented people will find ways of becoming more profitable, including, of course, through other kinds of income, that's fee income, this is a larger problem for now, which is the slowdown in deposit growth. And we will come back to this subject in later episodes. The electric vehicle pushback. I asked a friend, an automobile journalist, which EV car or electric car to buy if I would buy one. His answer, hold on. It's like buying the iPhone 5 when there is an iPhone 15 in the market, except that there is no iPhone 15 in the EV market now, which is what he was hinting at or telling me. So we're all presumably waiting for it. For various reasons, I am holding on for now, though in my own apartment complex, quite a few people own electric vehicles and there are charging stations as well. So there is no real fear of running out of juice unless you drive far and away, at least for now. So in India, the market is growing. So let's move on to the United States for a moment before we come back. 
Ford Motor said last week that it's slashing production of its F-150 or F-150 Lightning truck amidst flagging demand. The F-150 was launched in May 2021. The electric pickup has apparently been plagued with defects that have required recalls and it sold a mere 24,000 Lightnings last year and lost $36,000 on each electric vehicle in the third quarter, according to the Wall Street Journal. Car rental giant Hertz announced in October 2021 that they wanted to or they will buy 100,000 Teslas. At that time, apparently the stock price of both companies charged up, which is Tesla as well as Hertz, and Tesla's market capitalization crossed a trillion dollars. Over the next year, Hertz announced plans to buy about 65,000 pole stars and 175,000 electric vehicles from General Motors. Guess what? Now Hertz announced last week that it would sell roughly a third of its global electric vehicle fleet that includes the Teslas and use the proceeds to buy gasoline-powered cars. The cited reasons, weak demand for electric vehicles by people who obviously rent from Hertz and high repair costs. So the general impression is that electric vehicles have low maintenance costs. Apparently, as the Wall Street Journal is reporting, the opposite is true for Hertz. Even minor accidents can require batteries to be replaced, which can cost up to $20,000. Many EV parts aren't readily available, so cars have to sit in the shop for weeks, says the Wall Street Journal. Back home, electric two-wheeler scooter owners have faced a host of problems too. Some of it to do with a lack of effective communication on how to use a battery-operated vehicle. Hint, if you keep revving up like a petrol engine vehicle or if you put too much load, the battery will lose its efficacy. Similarly, if your charging methods are not as prescribed, which is more consistent. So there is some method to battery charging, as my colleague Jessica Jani reported in the core a week ago. Now, back in the United States, Americans don't want to plan trips around the locations of electric vehicle charging stations only to discover that the charges are broken. Nor do they want to download multiple apps to charge at different stations or worry about their battery range degrading in cold temperatures, a problem that's of course more in the United States than in India. The app problem, however, is identical to India, by the way. Interestingly, a Deloitte Global Automotive Consumer Survey last week found that 67% of US consumers said that they would still prefer a internal combustion engine for their next vehicle purchase, and only 6% said they preferred or favored a battery-powered EV, which is down from 8% last year. Now, India's EV market or electric vehicle market grew 50% in 2023, though 95% of that is driven by two-wheelers and three-wheelers used for transport of people and goods. Electric car sales are only 5% at this point, though if you live in a city like Mumbai or Delhi or elsewhere, you might see more of it proportionately on the streets. So the question obviously is, will Indian electric vehicle sales also hit a plateau of sorts, as it is evidently happening in the United States? It is tough to say right now, but our reporting suggests that the discontent around two-wheelers, and I mean electric two-wheelers, is still spreading. So therefore, an equilibrium of sorts will have to be reached before sales pick up again. An equilibrium between, let's say, the discontent and the company's response to it, and maybe the acceptance or the better understanding of how electric vehicles work and how batteries have to be treated. Now, electric has had a fair share of early adapters and adopters in India across categories. While more users come in and at what pace in 2024 is a little difficult to predict right now. Or like my friend says, will people wait for the iPhone 15, which of course isn't there? Watch this space. India's quantum mission goes on the road. The government of India approved the national quantum mission in April last year at a cost of about 6,000 crore rupees for the next seven years. The objective of this mission is to seed, nurture and scale up scientific and industrial R&D to create a vibrant and innovative ecosystem in quantum technology. And this is all being driven by the Department of Science and Technology. Now, quantum computers have many applications, but none of them, I assure you, are likely to be found in someone's basement. For example, the National Quantum Mission will focus on developing magnetometers with high sensitivity in atomic systems and atomic clocks for precision timing, communications and navigation. And there's much more. The first meeting of the Mission Governing Board of the National Quantum Mission was held last week under the chairmanship of Ajay Chaudhary, founder member of HCL Computers. So what is this mission about and how will quantum computing play out in India? I reached out to Ajay Chaudhary and I began by asking him first to define 
quantum computing for those of us who didn't know. And then tell us about what this mission was hoping to accomplish in the country. Quantum computing is based on the concept of quantum mechanics. And the thought on this has been around for a very long time. Work on this started somewhere around 1965. But only now have they started to become reasonably mainstream. Even now they're not mainstream, but yes, very soon they will be mainstream. And the reason for it is pretty clear that, for example, if you have a quantum computer sitting in China and you have your financial systems and all your other systems we're having you normal cryptography, it'll break it out any minute. You know, so it's very dicey if you don't have quantum computers of your own and you don't have quantum communications and cryptography of your own. So that really is the reason why quantum mechanics and quantum computers are happening. Now, they're significantly faster than, you know, the older classical computers, as I call them. The classical computers use bits, zero and one. You know, these quantum computers are using what are called qubits, quantum bits. And these quantum bits use zero, one, or a superposition of both states simultaneously. So it does not sort of work parallel, and therefore they are all not faster. Okay. What would take a computational power of a supercomputer of a 10 years to do will get done in 200 seconds. So that's the kind of power we are talking about. But it's not meant to replace classical computers. It is fundamentally to aid in newer areas where such computers would be of great value. So India set up National Quantum Mission and the mission governing board is what you chaired and the mission was announced in April last year. You just had first meeting of the mission governing board. So tell us about what the mission governing board is trying to bring together and what is the outcome that it's aiming for at this point? So basically the whole idea is that we create four verticals within this quantum mission. Okay, So these four verticals are going to be quantum computing, quantum communications, and quantum sensing and metrology, and quantum materials and devices. So these are the four verticals that we are working on. For each of these, we have defined certain targets for ourselves in terms of four years, six years, eight years. It's an eight-year program. And the total fund that's been created to, for supporting this program is around 6,000 crores, which is consisting of money coming in from DST and three other partners, or so to say, Partners are Department of Space, Department of Defense, and Department of Atomic Energy. Now, whole idea of this mission is to create a mission directorate post this meeting. And this mission directorate will then try and make sure that everybody works together with the same objectives of achieving these targets. So that's really what the whole thinking is. And what we did in this particular meeting is to figure out the process and this process we have been working on for a while. This process was approved in the meeting. So now we pretty much next week onwards, we will be sending out requests for proposals to people to apply for one of these thematic locations. So each of these themes will have one location which will be led by a prime institute. So for example, a TIFR could be lead quantum computers and that will become one thematic location. And around that will be various research locations and institutes that will work together in, on that theme. And each of these themes are very well defined and we, want, we have targets defined for each of these areas. And our whole objective would be to get a Section 8 companies created at these four locations which we will identify in the next six months. And we have defined step by step what process we are going to follow. And by about August, September, we would have chosen the finalists, the four theme locations, and then these theme institutions. And these theme institutions will have a Section 8 company that will actually have independent strategy to work on their own with all, you know, empowerment given to them. Right. So I'll come to one of those missions in a moment. But is this common for such initiatives to be driven by governments elsewhere in the world too? Or, or is uh, reason will private sector be involved? No, private sector, we will definitely involve. We want startups also to be involved in this. We want industry also to come in if they're actually working on it. And we've done some research on who all are working on it. And we are quite clear that there are close to about 150 researchers who are actually already working on quantum in India. So that's good news. Because there were there were some programs that were created by Methi as well as by TST, 
where a lot of work has been done in this area, but initial work, I would say. But as a result, what's happened is that there are about 10 institutions in the country who are actually been working on different parts of the quantum technologies. So if I were to pick something like sensing and metrology, I can I can maybe visualize it as a common person, what it could be that you would be able to, let's say, predict whether much better or you'd be able to compute more data to predict. Whole bunch of things like that. I think the significant part of this kind of product is going to be drug discovery. It's a very major area where it takes too long to do the computation today. And therefore, material science is a very big area. Artificial intelligence itself needs a lot of computing power. So artificial intelligence combined with quantum computing will make it definitely a whole lot faster and better. So these are some of the interesting areas that we uh, are looking at as applications to this, this project. Right. So on the physical aspect of it, so it's obviously something that you need a lot of cooling for. It's very large. It's much larger than what one can visualize a normal computer to be. So is that why governments are typically involved and what is the trajectory like? Reason for it is that different materials and a lot of these materials need very heavy cooling and therefore that only then they can perform. But interestingly, some other new areas are also emerging. You know, till now, if you look at all computing, it's based on silicon. But even uh, as I talk, there are some researchers in the world, like people like Finland and some other places, where they've actually looked at silicon itself to do quantum computing. So we will need to discover and identify certain materials where we will focus on. We will not do everything. So we will say, okay, based on the proposals we received from different researchers in the country, we will start to focus on a few materials and work on those materials. Right. Last question. So you talked about a four, six, eight year timeline. So what is it that we could see off, let's say, off the assembly line, so to speak, first? I think the low hanging fruit will be where some work has already been done in the country. And for example, there's a very nice quantum compute, quantum communication company startup that has come out of IIT Madras. They are called QNU. So they are already one of the six, seven companies in the world who have a uh, tested product for a certain distance. But you know, recently on satellite, America and China did this testing for quantum communication and they were able to do it for 4,000 kilometers. So, you know, in India also we want to do through space. Space is easier, but free space is tough. So, QNU has achieved something, but we need to support them to do go to 500, 1,000, 2,000 kilometers. And that's really when it starts to become interesting. Since you mentioned it already, so what does quantum communication mean? I mean, and when you said it could go up to so many thousands of kilometers. Totally secure, you know, totally secure. There is something called quantum, it's what is called the CKD, QKD. And these QKDs are basically keys that will enable you to connect distances, you know. So 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers, 400 kilometers, every stage the QKD works. And these are all boxes that have been created by example by QNG. And they have been tested in defense and some other locations already in the country. So we have progressed well to some extent in quantum communication. Quantum computer is going to be the toughest act. I think in the area of sensing, we have done some work and some work in some of the boxes that have been created in Department of Atomic Energy. So, you know, what we need to do is ensure that everybody is working together under a common mission directory. And that's what we need to achieve. And the job that we will be doing from our board is to ensure that every, everybody is working together and everybody is working towards a specific target and the time frame for that target. And the objective would be to main, ensure that we catch up. See, this is one of those technologies where we are just 5 to 10 years behind. In semiconductors, we are 50 years behind. So, you know, it's a great time for India to be launching something like this. And although our our funds are at this moment limited, but I think government is very open to extending this once we start to deliver results. You know, China spent $13 billion on this. Mr. Chaudhary, thank you so much for joining me. Great to talk to you. Bye-bye. Meanwhile, the calls for pre-proposals for setting up thematic quantum computing hubs have opened over the weekend and will close on 21st March 2024. Details are at online DST. Dot gov dot in. That's online dst.gov.in.
and from quantum computing to cricket. The Tata Group has bagged the title sponsorship of the Indian Premier League for 24 to 28 for apparently what is a record-breaking $300 million, according to the IPL, which revealed this on Saturday. IPL has become the world's richest T20 tournament with an estimated brand value of $8.4 billion, Reuters reported. The IPL has been a cash cow for the Indian Cricket Board with the 10-team league's 2023-27 to media rights fetching $6.2 billion. That's it for me for today on the note that the cricket season is gearing up. Remember, the markets are shut for today. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopsis or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening. <laughs>